So let's open God's Word now. Familiar passage we've looked at in the weeks when Breck was teaching in this particular series. We're going to go back to Matthew chapter 28 this morning. If you're visiting with us, uh, I want to welcome you as well. and Thank you for joining us to worship the Lord this morning. What we're doing this summer is we are working through a series on political theology. Um, our desire and our goals in this, first of all, were to bring some of these things to the attention of our people. Political theology is one of those branches of theology that many of us just haven't studied all that much, but the scriptures are rich and history is rich with an understanding and, and examples of how the people of God have sought to serve in the world by influencing the world for the glory of God. And so today, what I want to talk to you about is what does Christian influence in the world look like? And do we have biblical examples and historical examples of that? And the answer is yes, we do. But I want to read the text, and then I want to expand on it a little bit, but I also want to just talk to you about some of the things that happened in the news yesterday. So in Matthew chapter 28, and we'll look at the familiar section on the Great Commission, starting in verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, All authority... In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, or you could read, as you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is God's word. Let me pray for us before we go any further. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for loving us through Christ, even as we sung and read earlier, but while we were yet sinners, you sent your Son to die for us. And Father, we are the recipients of your mercy and grace. We are the products of your work through your Spirit and the preaching of the Gospel to change our hearts and draw us into relationship with you. And as your people, we seek to be faithful. We want to walk faithfully with you, both in our homes and in our communities and our workplaces and and even when it comes to the things that relate to our nation father help us to be faithful and we want to be guided by your word in all of these things not simply by emotion or our own ideas we want to be guided by your word we want to be people of the word and so father as we study this morning as we think broadly about this subject uh, lord would you guide us would you help us would you bring to our memory and pierce our hearts with truths that maybe we haven't seen in the same light that we're going to look at them today. And Lord, I do thank you for our children. I thank you for these young people being raised in the fear and admonition of the Lord, singing songs of praise to you. I pray that you would plant deep in their hearts a, a sincere love for you, that you would work by your spirit to renew their hearts, to make them yours, and that you would grow them up in the faith, and that they would have their own legacy to leave in the years to come. Lord, we, we ask all of these things, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you desire to give good gifts to your children, but we plead your mercy, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We live in dark and troubling days. Yesterday's assassination attempt on the life of our former president and current presidential candidate was an evil action and one that I heartily condemn. Political activism and animosity have become common in our country. And I want to be clear that at no time in this series on political theology have we, Breck nor myself, presented to you any type of viewpoint or instruction that should ever lead to the kind of violent act that we witnessed yesterday. In the course of this series, we have spoken specifically about our duty as Christians to confront governing authorities, and even to defy them when the situation calls for it. But the type of confrontation that is modeled for us in Scripture and which we encourage is through verbal dialogue, not lethal weapons. An example would be the prophet Nathan confronting King David over his sin with Bathsheba. That's a confrontation, a godly confrontation, and a call for rebuke and repentance. The type of defiance that is modeled in Scripture would be the apostles choosing not to obey the commands of the high priest, calling for them to stop preaching of Jesus. 
They defied the council and accepted the consequence of their defiance, but their defiance never rose to the level of attempted murder. Brothers and sisters, our instruction to you is that we seek to honor and obey Christ in all that we do, especially through our engagement in the political sphere in this world. And we do this by following the teaching and example of Jesus himself, who did not resort to violence in his opposition to the evil of the world, but he spoke the truth, he cared for those in need, and then he even laid down his life for his people. Our model and example is self-sacrificial love, not violence. I want to make that abundantly clear. Now, I mentioned earlier that we had some goals as we sat down and began to plan through this series. As we considered this subject of political theology, if, if you didn't know before, perhaps you've grown to understand now that it is a very broad subject with thousands of years of history behind it. And as we considered this series, there were a handful of goals that we wanted to accomplish. First, we wanted to fill in some of the gaps that exist in our understanding of what the Bible and historical theology can teach us about how God's people have thought and acted in the realm of political engagement. Hopefully we've done a little bit of that, although I know we haven't covered everything. There's no way you can do that. And then secondly, we wanted to explore the practical ways that Christians can engage in our society while being faithful to Christ and, at the same time, exerting significant Christian influence in the realm of politics. Now, to many of you, that seems like a perfectly reasonable step to take. But I understand that some of you may think that that's a step in the wrong direction. Many people believe that any engagement on the part of Christians in politics is fueled by some desire for the government to compel or or coerce citizens toward a particular religious belief. That's being talked about right now in the media and has been for years. I do believe that the scriptures teach Christians to use our prophetic voice to exert influence upon society, but I reject the notion that we should use government as a strong arm to compel citizens to follow Christ. Genuine faith in Christ cannot be forced or coerced because it is the result of God's Spirit at work in man's heart through the preaching of the gospel. Now, others would believe that the government should exclude religion altogether. You may remember, if you were here a few weeks ago, Breck pointed out that many of us have learned to think about the relationship between church and the state, or church and politics, as two diametrically opposed spheres, one sacred and one secular. And and just to be honest, there are many faithful and respected Christian leaders who believe in that divide. They believe that the sole responsibility of Christians in this world is to preach the gospel and leave the politics to the world. And they would reason that, after all, the government has been given the task of wielding the sword for the sake of law and liberty, while the church has been given the task of wielding the sword of the Spirit for the sake of redemption. Now, you might fall into one of those two camps. You might not fall into either of those camps. But it is certainly true that one of our main responsibilities is to preach Christ crucified. One of our main responsibilities as born-again ambassadors for Christ is to preach the gospel, make disciples, and then teach them all that Christ has commanded. But I would argue that that last phrase, teaching them all that Christ commanded, includes everything that the Bible teaches especially the wealth of instruction pertaining to our role as biblically-minded citizens in this world. I'll just throw out some things that we, are, we know we're commanded to do that fall outside of the realm of preaching the gospel. We are to love our neighbors. We are to do justice. We are to seek the welfare of our cities. We are to promote what is good, and we are to live before men in such a way that they could see our good and righteous works and give glory to God. We are to be people of faith. And as we look at that through the whole lens of Scripture, we understand that we are to be a people of a faith that is so pervasive that it compels us to bring the truth of God's Word to bear in every sphere under Christ's authority. We learned a few weeks ago that the church is one sphere in the broad scope of God's kingdom. And as the church, we have been given the responsibility 
to be a unique prophetic voice that influences not just our sphere, but every sphere under the kingdom of God heading. I'll give you an example of that. When, when Breck had the slide up on the, the board, you might remember it, it had the kingdom of God over the top and then the individual spheres underneath. Well, there was the sphere of the church, there was the fear, sphere of the state, there was the sphere of the family. Now, let's think about this for a minute. The church is one sphere, the family is another sphere. But as the church, we don't ignore the sphere of the family in our quest to do evangelism, do we? No, we don't. No Christian that I know argues that the church should simply do evangelism and be silent with regard to instruction on the family. Instead, what we do is we speak the truth of God's word to influence families for the sake of God's glory. We use our God-given voice to exert Christian influence in the sphere of the family, and I'm arguing we should do that in every sphere beneath the banner of the kingdom of God, not just one but all of them. And so with that in mind, I want to argue this morning that the the political sphere is not one that we should simply ignore. And we have thousands of years of biblical and Christian history to support that. For thousands of years, the people of God have boldly labored for the sanctity of human life, an issue that puts them and us well within the political sphere. Christians have sought to care for the poor, for the widows and orphans in their communities. Christians have established hospitals and schools and entire communities. They've advocated for just laws that reflect the character of God revealed in Scripture and in the commandments. And yes, Christians have actively engaged in politics for the glory of God, seeking to extend Christian influence within the societies where they were citizens. And what I plan to do this morning is to support all of that with examples. I want us to walk through a series of passages from the Old and New Testaments. Many of them are going to be very familiar to us, but what they do is they show us not only God's people working in a religious way, but they show God's people working to influence the politics of the world during their time for the glory of God. Then I also want to remind you of something of history, and this is going to be a broad oversimplification of where we have come to the place where we are now and what the early church and the Roman Catholic Church and the Reformers thought about this relationship between the church and the state. And then I want to conclude the sermon with a warning and a reminder. Okay, so that's where we're going. So let's let's first, let me more fully hope to try to define what I mean by significant Christian influence and where I got that phrase from. Many of you are familiar with Wayne Grudem, a theologian and author in his book, Politics According to the Bible, which we have a copy in our library. It's an excellent read. It's, it's pretty dense, but it's very helpful. Um, in that book, Politics According to the Bible by Wayne Grudem, he proposes the view, and this is a quote, that Christians should seek to influence civil government according to God's moral standards and God's purposes for government as revealed throughout the Bible. And this shouldn't be shocking because that's precisely what Breck and I have been working to do these last six weeks, to encourage you along those lines. Grudem goes on to say that significant influence does not mean angry, belligerent, intolerant, judgmental, red-faced, and hate-filled influence, but rather winsome and kind and thoughtful and loving and persuasive influence that is suitable to each circumstance and that always protects the other person's right to disagree what we would understand to be religious liberty, but that is also uncompromising about the truthfulness and moral goodness of the teaching of God's Word. I think this view helps us. I think this view, while it may not be absolutely perfect, I think it helps us to understand something of our responsibility while also helping us to avoid two ditches on either side of faithfulness in this area. One ditch would be to Embrace a social gospel to focus only on societal problems, to embrace a social gospel that has caused so many professing Christians to abandon a consistently biblical gospel ministry in their attempt to bring social and political change. That's one ditch. The other ditch 
is to abandon the Christian role to provide significant prophetic voice of influence in culture and politics by focusing exclusively on our primary role as evangelists. I don't think either one of those positions accurately reflect what we see in Scripture. We need to remember that Christians are not saved through political action, but neither are we to abandon our faith as we engage in family life, in our workplaces, nor in the realm of politics. And like I mentioned earlier, we have an abundance of biblical examples where we can see the people of God seeking to exert such influence in the realm of politics. So let's look at the Old Testament. And I want us to just think about some of these characters, these names of individuals. And I don't want us to just think about them in light of their religious contributions, but also their societal, political contributions. Let's start with Abraham. We know about Abraham. He was the original patriarch of the family of God's people on earth. God extended a covenant relationship to him, a covenant promise to him, and we are the recipients of that promise. He was a man of faith, but he was also a tribal leader. He was a political leader in his own right. He trained and employed a standing army. He brokered peace deals with other tribal leaders, and he negotiated the purchase of land. Let's move on to his great-grandson. You remember Joseph. Joseph, through a sordid, very difficult and painful life of suffering as a young man, became the second most powerful political leader in Egypt by God's hand. And he also ordered the largest international agricultural plan to that point in human history. And then he administered the distribution of agricultural resources to all of the tribes and nations along the Nile Basin. Yes, he was a man of faith, but he also was gifted and used by God to influence the politics of his day in an incredible way. Let's think about Moses. Well, who was Moses? Well, Moses was God's spokesman, and he engaged with Pharaoh for the liberation of an entire oppressed people group. What about Joshua? Joshua was a military commander. He strategized and ordered the movement of Israel's military forces against the pagan nations inhabiting the land of Canaan. It's easy for us to think about these patriarchs and leaders of God's people as religious men, but we should also remember that they were gifted in ways that led to the building of nations. They were skilled in negotiation, skilled in agricultural agriculture, in warfare, in establishing the rule of law within Israel. God blessed and guided them every step of the way, but it is clear that they functioned within God's plan to influence the politics of the world in incredible ways. And these are some of the most notable figures in our Old Testament. In the Old Covenant, and when I'm talking about the Old Covenant, I'm talking about the relationship that God had with the nation of Israel. In that covenant relationship, there was a structure of leadership that employed both religious and political leaders. And you, we all know this to be true. I'm just pointing it out. There were prophets and priests, but there were also judges and kings. And this phase of Old Covenant times, it, it represents a very unique place in the history of redemption. The church today doesn't have the same function that the nation of Israel did in that Old Covenant paradigm. But the government of Israel, it, it became quite elaborate, and it served to guide the spiritual as well as the socio-political lives of God's people. Those two things were not mutually exclusive. The major difference between Israel and the other nations of the world was that Israel was in covenant with the one true God. But like those other nations, it had institutions and civil laws. It had a standing military force that secured its borders and fought to protect its people. And I'll fast forward quite a bit here. In the end, the nation of Israel proved unfaithful to the covenant promise they had made with God. And when the majority of the nation of Israel rejected Christ, they lost something of their special status with God and their national sovereignty as well. But there's another portion of the Old Testament, the, the portion that we understand to be the, the prophets. And in the prophets, we see that this relationship between religious influence and political influence, we see that continue. We see that God used these prophets to exercise strong influence on the political powers of the day. And I don't want to rehash what Brecht taught in the weeks prior, but he drew our attention to this quite a bit. 
Maybe we didn't make the connection. I'm hoping that we will today at least. But think about Daniel. What did Daniel do? Daniel influenced Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, when he said to him in Daniel chapter 4, verse 27, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Now we see that and maybe we, we tend to just think about it in religious ways, but let me, let me point something out about what Daniel did not say so that we can see something of this dynamic. Daniel did not say, listen, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm just a Jewish prophet, so don't let my counsel sway you in any way. He didn't say that. He did not say, you know what, you're a leader of a secular nation, so you should simply allow your own brand of secular morality to influence your decisions. That would be something of a a, a separation between church and state. That's not what Daniel did. Daniel urged the king to follow his counsel. And not only did he do that, he urged the king to repent of his sin and to do justice in accordance with the word and will of Yahweh. Daniel was exerting influence as a man of God. He was an Israelite prophet, but he used his prophetic voice to exert influence over the politics of his day, even to the point, as we know later in Daniel's story, even to the point that he was willing to put his own life and freedom on the line when the king issued a decree that would cause him to disobey the command of God. Now, a simple survey of the prophets will show that Daniel is not the only one who exerted this kind of godly influence over the pagan nations of the day. The first two chapters of the book of Amos. I don't know when the last time you read Amos, but in the first two chapters of the book of Amos, which I preached years and years ago, and I remember working through those chapters, and it was was God addressing the sins of the nations through the prophet. And I remember thinking, when are we going to get through all of this threat of judgment? But if you go back and you look, what was God using the prophet to do? To call out the pagan nations of the day and call them to repentance, to call them to a biblical morality because they were sinning in the face of God. And God was threatening them with judgment if they did not repent. And he used the prophet to do that. You think about Jonah. We love the story of Jonah for a lot of reasons. But what was Jonah called to do? He was sent to Nineveh, a pagan nation, And he was sent to call that nation to repentance. Isaiah has 13 chapters devoted to the addressing of the sins of foreign nations. Jeremiah has six and Ezekiel has seven. God used these prophets not simply to address the religious issues within the nation of Israel, but also to exert influence, moral influence, over the pagan nations of their time. And I know that's just a brief like skipping of stones on the water. But what does this show us? It shows us a pattern of the people of God using their prophetic voice in the world, calling all people to acknowledge God's moral standards because by those moral standards, all men will be judged. We see that over and over again. These prophets, they addressed kings. They also addressed common people. They addressed family dynamics. They addressed business. They addressed trade, they they addressed religion, and they also addressed the actions of those government officials that they were directly in contact with. And all of this evidence leads to a simple conclusion that believers have a responsibility to bear witness to the moral standards of the Bible by which God will hold all people accountable, including those in public office. And that's the Old Testament. We could continue... But let's move on to the New Testament. Let's think about the New Testament. Do we see any examples of significant Christian influence on the political realm in the New Testament? Well, actually, we do. Do you remember, do you remember John the Baptist? Do you remember why John the Baptist was arrested? Okay. Here's what was going on. John the Baptist was not just preaching repentance because of the, the kingdom was at hand and calling people to be baptized as a show of their repentance, but he was also pointing his finger at the king, or in this particular case, not the king, but the, the, the politician who had been uh, appointed by Rome to rule over Judea. He was pointing out the sins of Herod. 
Herod was a tetrarch, a Roman appointed governor. He was the ruler over Judea, and Herod was this politician, and John the Baptist was arrested because he was calling him out for his sins. This is what Luke tells us in Luke chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. It tells us that John the Baptist preached good news to the people, but Herod the tetrarch, who had been reproved by him, in other words, John had been calling him out for his sin, for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done. John the Baptist, both barrels came out. I'm sorry, that was a bad analogy. He, he, he used all of his influence to call out the sins of this man. And as it was because of this that Herod locked him up in prison. John the Baptist used his public platform to address the sins of the governing ruler of Jerusalem. He used his voice to exert influence upon the highest ranking politician of his day. And we see another example of this. We don't just see it in John the Baptist. We actually see it in the, the Apostle Paul. You remember when the Apostle Paul was in Roman custody. And, and along the way, he's appealing to the leaders who were over him. And in one particular instance, he has an opportunity in his custody to speak to the Roman governor named Felix. Do you remember this particular story? This comes in Acts 24. And he was just kind of being passed around. They were playing games with him. They were trying to get money out of him. They were trying to extort Paul. But in one particular instance, this is Acts chapter 24, it says, After some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. If you stop right there, we would say, well, there, there's the responsibility, preaching the gospel. Yes, Paul took full advantage of his responsibility and his opportunities to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's not all he did. In the next verse, in verse 25, it says, and he reasoned. In other words, he's dialoguing. That word there is dialegami. He's having a dialogue with Felix about righteousness and about self-control and about the coming judgment. And the text tells us that Felix was alarmed and he said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Now, why is all this important? Because it shows us clear examples, not just from the Old Testament, but also from the New Testament of God's people using their prophetic voice to exert influence over the politics of their day. Paul reasoned with the governor. He was in dialogue. He was using his words to teach him about righteousness which is God's standard of morality. He was teaching him about self-control, which is how we are to live in light of God's moral law. And then he taught him about the coming judgment. Those who do not live according to God's precepts and revelation of Christ will face the judgment of God. Paul didn't relegate his conversation to gospel only. It was gospel and influence. These men had no intentions, this is a little bit maybe on the nose here, but these men had no intention of following a man-made edict that there must be a separation between the church and the state. These men used their voice to preach the gospel, yes, but they also used their voice in an attempt to influence the politics of their time. Influencing government for good, here's another quote from Grudem, influencing government for good on the basis of of the wisdom found in God's word is a theme that runs through the entire Bible. Okay, so we've looked at Old Testament examples. We've seen some New Testament examples. What about some examples from history? Now, this is dangerous. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. It's dangerous to try to summarize historical movements and thoughts when it comes to theology, but that's what I'm going to do, so I'm walking into treacherous waters here. Church history has revealed a broad range of ideas. You need to know that. A broad range of ideas when it comes to how, we, how this relationship between the church and the state should be managed. The early church, the early church fathers, they were constantly interacting with political leaders and constantly facing persecution from those leaders. There's much to learn about their ideas and their thoughts. The Roman Catholic Church developed kind of a baseline way of understanding the relationship between the church and the state, and they made a distinction between nature and grace. And when I, when I say those two phrases, I, I honestly want you to be thinking the same things that Breck pointed out, that sacred secular idea, because that's the nexus of it. That's where it really comes from in political history. 
Thomas Aquinas was a Roman Catholic theologian, and he helped to develop this doctrine. He argued that the political state operates on the basis of natural reason. He argued that the state governs the natural life of mankind, while the church governs the spiritual life of mankind. He wanted there to be a, a, a strong separation between those two things, even though that didn't necessarily work out in reality. And in this view, the state is guided by natural reason, not Scripture. This nature-grace divide, like I said, is very similar to that sacred-secular distinction that Breck taught on and argued against in the week's prior. Now during the Reformation, and I know I'm just speeding through this, during the Reformation, Martin Luther developed a slightly different form of this. Luther argued that the sphere of the state was to be governed by reason and natural law. And when he references natural law, he's talking about basic understandings of human nature and human morality as revealed in Scripture, but not solely revealed in Scripture. So he adds a little bit to this reason and natural law rather than the whole content of Scripture. Scripture instructs the state by asserting basic natural laws, but political authorities could also contradict the Scriptures by means of human reason. That was kind of the development of Luther's thought in this regard. Uh, Luther developed a view known as the two kingdoms of God view. God rules over the left-hand kingdom, the state, by human reason and natural law, but over the right-hand kingdom, the church, by both law and grace. And, and this is just a slightly more refined version of that same sacred secular distinction. John Calvin more or less adopted Luther's view, but he stressed that the government must attend to both tables of the law, so his understanding would have been that all of the Ten Commandments, even those commands to honor Yahweh as God, were to be part of the state's governing body of information. But he also acknowledged that this was paradoxical, that it was inconsistent, because his foundational belief was in that same sacred-secular divide. It was confusing. And then, like Breck mentioned a few weeks ago, Abraham Kuyper follows in the line of those reformers, a, a Dutch theologian. He developed an entirely different approach in his doctrine of sphere sovereignty. For Kuyper, the church and the state were not these diametrically opposed entities that had to follow different guidelines, but the church and the state were simply distinct spheres of authority ordained by God. And they exist under the authority of Christ as the king of the kingdom of God, as we read in Matthew 28. In Kuiper's view, each sphere of authority was to remain subject to God's revelation because each sphere comes under the major heading of the kingdom of God. No sphere is outside of God's sovereign rule. Therefore, each sphere must be governed and directed by God's word. And one thing I would point out about this, and I mentioned it earlier, I just want to keep bringing it to your mind. One thing that I want to point out about this idea of sphere sovereignty is that the church maintains a very unique position among the other spheres. We maintain a position of having a uniquely prophetic voice that God calls for us to extend to all of those other spheres. Again, in the past few weeks, Breck has taught extensively on this doctrine, and it is my position that this teaching helps to make sense out of what we see in Scripture. And the truth is that the church has not always agreed on the proper relationship between the church and the state, but it is also true that the church has nearly always had a significant level of influence in persuading governments to place a higher value on certain things, like the sanctity of human life, the freedom of religion, the foundational importance of the nuclear family, and on the need for a fundamental adherence to biblical moral law. It was on the basis of Christian influence that Certain societal evils have been opposed and in many ways abolished. The early church, the Christians fought to end abortion and infanticide. The early Christians in the Roman Empire fought to end the murderous gladiatorial contests. They fought to end pagan rituals of human sacrifice and polygamy and the burning alive of widows and slavery on multiple continents. And these are, no doubt, ideas and schemes that fall within the realm of the political. Christians have fought to secure property rights 
in accordance with biblical principles, and it was through significant Christian influence that our own U.S. Declaration of Independence acknowledged that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes, our foundation as a nation was greatly influenced by Christian thought and morality. It is also true that the church throughout history has not always influenced politics for good. It's not the purpose of this sermon, but I want to acknowledge that. But it is also true that through significant Christian influence, the people of God have secured remarkable benefits to our nation and the world. Now, in some cultures throughout history, there was not much that Christians could do to influence the politics of the day. And so they did what the Scriptures command us to do. They prayed for governing authorities. They prayed for those in positions of authority over them, and then they modeled faithful Christian lives in the hopes of bringing influence in that way. But where Christian voices have been able to exert influence, they have worked to shape the history of the world in a godly direction. Christians have wielded the sword of God's word to preach the gospel to the nations, and they have sought to influence those who wield the sword of politics in a way that brings glory to God and peace to society. And I believe that when we can influence political structures and policies, we should. We should. And I talked about that quite a bit last week as well. Where we can influence political structures and policies, we should. And in our modern democracy, we have both a right and, I would say, a responsibility to vote according to our most deeply held biblical convictions, and we should use our prophetic voice to influence every sphere within the kingdom of God. Now there's the body of the sermon. And in conclusion, I'm going to offer you two things. A warning and a reminder. A warning and a reminder. A warning first. In the Revelation, the book of the Revelation, John saw a vision of two beasts. One coming out of the sea and one rising from the earth. Now a few years ago, I taught extensively on this. I'm not going to rehash that for you this morning. But these two beasts represent two idolatrous symbols that Christ warns us about. They represent the power of the demonized state and the power of false religion. The first beast is a symbolic reference to the evil nations of the world who seek to take the place of God in our hearts. The beast is a counterfeit put forward by our spiritual enemy tempting us to put our hope in the state, in the government, and in men rather than in Christ. The second beast is a symbolic reference to false religion whose prophets twist the truth of God's word or deny it altogether to lead humanity astray. And the warning is this. Do not put your hope in the state or in false religion. Don't put your hope in political processes. Don't put your eternal hope in the state, or in men, or in governments. If I could go back to that picture in the Revelation, the only people who are safe from the power of these beasts are those who have put their full hope and trust in the Lamb of God who was slain for the salvation of His people. That is the only protection we have from the demonized state and false religion, right? According to this image and this vision. That's what I want to remind you of. No one will be saved from sin and experience the joy and peace of eternity through allegiance to the state. Only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God who lived for us and died in our place, can we have the hope of true victory and the promise of eternal life to come. But as Christians, we do have marching orders. And it's reflected in Matthew 28. We have marching orders to go into all the world, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, making disciples, and teaching them all that Christ has commanded. And I believe that this all includes how they can follow the example of the men and women who have gone before us to shape the world. We have a responsibility to use our voice as Christians to influence our own families, our homes, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our communities, our states, and yes, our nation with the truth of God's Word and for the glory of God. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the the instruction that it gives us. I thank you for the examples that you have recorded for us.
And yes, we know that these are difficult days. And yes, we know that there is a lot of information that we have to try to sift through to make sense out of how we can be faithful. And Lord, I pray that Breck and I are able to do that as preachers and teachers so that we can be better equipped by your word to be faithful to you. Lord, don't let us neglect the responsibility we have to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, both in this pulpit and in our homes and in our workplaces and in all the relationships that you give us. We are to be ambassadors for you, making our appeal to those in the world to be reconciled to God through faith in Christ. That is primary work and responsibility that we have as a church, but but our responsibility goes beyond that, and we know this, that we can seek to be faithful as salt and light in the world that you've placed us to, to provide and exert a Christian influence on as much as possible. And so, Lord, help us to be faithful in those tasks. Help us to be fruitful in those tasks, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing.